nothing better than being muted and <laughs> speaking. Like we just talked about this, Brent, and I can't even <laughs> listen and follow simple instructions. Usually, for context, when the, when it comes out of the break like that, my uh, it, it unmutes for me. But for some reason, it didn't do it this time. So I'm going to blame the software. And I don't know if Brent can hear me because Brent, can you hear me? So I'm gonna yeah, I'm. Ha I'm having an audio problem. So carry and on. I'll be right back. You're very good. Nothing like having technical issues right at the onset. So let's. Um, first of all. It's been kind of a kind of a busy morning. We announced a whole bunch of really amazing stuff, um, a lot of really cool features and, and services in the container world here at AWS. Brent, you hear me now? Yeah, and I could hear you before. My problem was I could hear you twice, and I couldn't. You know, you know how it is when there's audio playing on your computer and you can't find it. Yeah, I found it. So you had the blog good open, now. Huh? Yes. <laughs> I did that too, but I figured it out in the in the intro. You just were a little late. Yeah, I was like, where is that coming from? So yeah, <laughs> I did not figure it out as fast as you. Good call. So so anyways, as as I was saying, you know, there are a lot of announcements. Um, and I think one of the announcements that was drawing a lot of a lot of comments, a lot of excitement was Proton. And as you can see, we have um, some gentlemen from the Proton team. I will let them introduce themselves. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll start with you, Rafa. Why don't you just introduce yourself? What do you do? And, and yeah, we'll go to Patrick. Sounds good. Hello, everybody. I am Rafa. I'm a product manager in the containers team. And I am the product manager for AWS Proton. Been working on this all this year along with Patrick and a bunch of other people. Nice. Welcome. And uh, I'm Patrick. I'm a senior front end engineer, and I work on the uh, Proton console team. And uh, with Rafa, we worked really hard this last 10 months to, to, to get this done. Awesome. What I mean, you guys have been working on Proton for so long. Uh, you know, when when it was just an idea, what what was the problem that you wanted to solve? What were you trying to tackle? So I can comment on that. We, what we saw is that there were several of our customers that we would talk to frequently that have started to or had finished or were in the process of building some sort of internal platform to manage all of their deployments. As the amount of deployments, microservices that they were running was growing, they, they were trying to tackle these, these issues in a way that was comprehensive and gave them control and ensure that everything was standardized while the developers could keep moving fast. And so what, what we realized is, well, first of all, it, building this is expensive. It's hard. You're now owning and maintaining this complex piece of software that is not core to your business. So can we help you with that? And it's also not in the reach of a lot of, a lot of customers. It takes a lot of investment and time to put that together. So. Can we make that better for you? Can we give you something that will enable you to feel confident that your infrastructure is meeting those needs without you having to spend his years putting that together and maintaining it? So that was the initial impetus to go and ask questions about how do you manage your infrastructure? What are the issues that you're facing? What is this not doing for you? What can we do for you? And that's how Proton started to, to become a thing. Nice. And you know, I know you have talked to a lot of customers and you've, you know, asked them, what are your biggest pain points and, and obviously landed on this. But um, when you when you look at some of the some some of the big container customers, when I talk to them, I hear about, you know, there are a lot of times they're building a platform and it's and all that we ever end up hearing about is the platform that they're building. And, you know, it's just the platform, the platform, the platform. That's that's like such a big, such a big area that they that they spend uh, tons of time on and tons of effort on. And you know, to me, when I when I read about Proton and heard about Proton, I was like, wow, this this completely alleviates that that team from a ton of heavy lifting, a ton of, you know, stuff that they don't actually have to do. And instead they can focus on just offering 
the services that they need to offer. So if you just talk to a platform team, all that they really are after is, you know, they're experts in AWS. They know how to offer AWS services in a, in a connected way, in a secure way, in a redundant way. So giving them the ability to offer those, offer all of that intelligence up in a, in a now consumable way, uh, I think this is going to be huge for, for uh, platform teams. So uh, that's really awesome. Texan Raj, uh, by the way, good to see you again. He says he needs some Proton. So uh, just in the nick of time, maybe? We're on it. Uh, this is really cool. <laughs> Mui Steve, welcome back. It's a long time no see. He's uh, excited about Proton also. And then Alex Smasha, of course, our resident uh, intern, uh, pops pops in a ton of uh, URLs and we actually will we'll throw those out uh, over time also um, so let's just let's just re recap proton for a second what is it really I think when I look at it I like to think of it as a platform for building platforms is that is that fair to say it's a little bit cliche but I think it's kind of a cool cool way to say it um, how would you describe it? either Rafa or Patrick. I'll let Rafa speak to it since uh, he's the expert. <laughs> there are, I think there are a couple of ways that we could describe it. The, the official word we're using for it is it's an application deployment service, right? You think about your application as being a set of connected microservices. Each one of them has infrastructure. It has shared resources that it's going to employ. It has a pipeline to get the code from the repo to actually running. It has alarms, observability, et cetera, et cetera. Proton is the tool where you define all of that, and then it deploys it for you. One, a thousand times as many as need be. Um, we, 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 at some point, also thought about describing it as, like you actually describe it, like a platform to build your own internal pass. A pass is a tool where you show up as a developer, provide a couple of data points, including your code location, and then it deploys, voila, nothing else to do. Can we do that? But the infrastructure in which it's, in which it's running is not defined by whoever owned the pass, but defined by your infrastructure team. Both descriptions go to speak about the same thing, which is enabling organizations to define the architecture of their applications and enabling developers to just get those running quickly. So yeah. basically, and it's it's a way to you know Brent you 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 mentioned this earlier it, rather than having to have a team dedicated to building and managing a platform, I shift my focus. That team shifts from the platform focus to service focus to application focus to what matters for my end users. You know, if I'm a, on the platform team, my customers aren't just the customers of our business, but it's the developers. It's people that need to build uh, and, and run their code somewhere. So. We're now taking that burden. AWS holds that burden and allows the platform team to just build those templates for reusability. And it, is it fair to say it's just one click to play? I know we're going to demo it, so I'm really excited. But yeah, we're going to demo. It's just yeah. one click, and and you're there. Yeah, I, I would say a couple of things. First of all, you absolutely hit it with with what you said, and it's funny because it feels like this is canned, and I'm going to use the same words tomorrow in my session about Proton, but when we think about what's the vision for this, well, why are we trying to build this? There are tons of choices and decisions that you have to make as an infrastructure team when you're dealing with AWS. And that's a good thing, right? We are proud to give more tools to builders than anybody else and tools that do excellent work for you. So you're sitting there looking at what can I do? What is best for my business? You should be able to feel empowered to spend as much time as you need making that decision so that when the decision is made, it just will work for you. You don't want to have to think about, well, probably XYZ new feature that they just announced at reInvent is phenomenal, but man, oh man, it's going to be hard to get this across the organization. No, just, just you feel like you can make decisions that are good for the business and it will just happen for you. And that's our goal with this. Again, lots to do to get there, uh, undeniably, but that's, that's the vision for Proto. That's what we're trying to strive for. Yeah. And there was a question in chat. Uh, 
I think that we should we should hit on it's from Anton. Uh, hey guys, show show it in action. We're going to. Don't worry. Uh, it's hard to understand how it relates to AWS Service Catalog, CloudFormation modules, Terraform. So uh, I don't know. Does anyone want to uh, sort of call out how the, the distinctions uh, between those services? Adam, what do you think? You want me to do it? I mean, you know, anyone. Well, actually, I. So, you know, when I view this, um, I think it's there's a little more power here. You know, Rafa, we talked about it earlier with with Proton, the, the templating engine, right? There's a little more to it than just straight cloud formation. And you know, I think Service Catalog um, is more kind of generic focused. I think here the focus, and Rafa, I'm stealing your words, but is really focused on those teams building microservices, right? You're, you're building smaller applications, you know, uh, to fit in the grand scheme of, of, you know, larger services. So it's empowering multiple teams. It's empowering a platform team to build a centralized platform to serve to their developers um, in a, in a ingestible way that that's easy to use, easy to build on. But yeah. Rafa, maybe you can touch more on the, the service catalog difference and, yeah. and that. So I would say a couple of things. CloudFormation and Terraform are basically tools to model your infrastructure, right? You create those templates, you share them, and you use to, you use to deploy them. We build on top of that. I, I've seen lots of questions today in Twitter and in some other places about, does this just work with CloudFormation? Uh, I'll just go quick and say, yes, at preview, but we definitely will work with Terraform as well. It's in our roadmap. We have to build it. Um, but the idea is we rely on those infrastructure as code tools to help you model your infrastructure. But then we, uh, we add a bunch of other pieces to it. First of all, when you go, if you are a developer and you're deploying a CloudFormation template, you now own their stack. You have to keep it updated. If there is a change, you have to be in charge of it. You actually might have to deploy it multiple times because you have multiple instances and then connect your pipeline. We try to come up with at a higher level and say, just give us one thing and we'll take care of how many stacks are needed, how they're connected together, how they are connected to your pipeline, and also how they get updated when the template that is running behind them changes. Service catalog, the experience of using Proton and Service Catalog is actually very similar for the developer. Show up to a, to a, to a UI, enter a bunch of data points, and the, the stack gets deployed. However, once again, it's the same story. Service Catalog is an incredibly powerful tool to manage and vend your CloudFormation templates. Proton takes a step a bit further than that and says, well, sure, just one part of the puzzle. Let's put them all together in one combined experience. We're working closely with the Service Catalog team. We want to integrate and we want to make sure that a customer that's using Service Catalog can still use it to vend those CloudFormation templates that then show up in Arrow and Proton, Arrow was the code name in Proton, and use it um, and use them as part of the forming their Proton services. Nice. So short answer is, uh, and I've seen a ton. I've seen a ton of questions scroll through now about, uh, you know, can we use this to build a platform? What's the relationship between this and code pipeline or code deploy, et cetera? This can basically build code pipeline for you. So instead of thinking about it in terms of does Code Pipeline use Proton? It's really can Proton build Code Pipeline? And uh, let's just talk about it. And also, I've seen all the comments. Are we going to show this or not? So yes, we're going to show it too. Let's go ahead and get to that. But I want to talk about this in terms of what we see a ton of in the enterprise space. We see a ton of teams that are engineering teams that are reorganizing themselves. And there's always a debate. Do we need two pizza teams where every team owns absolutely everything start to finish? They own all their infrastructure, et cetera. You can certainly do it that way. But and in fact, you know, I, I know historically uh, AWS has even kind of recommended doing it that way because that's how we do it. However, um, what we see a lot of when we talk to other, especially enterprise customers, is we see a lot of enterprise customers who don't have the staffing and the resources to do it that way. So they reorganize into a platform team and then a set of service teams. 
So Proton directly addresses that kind of organization uh, by allowing a platform team to build and vend platforms and then allowing service teams to consume those. So let's actually do that. Uh, we launched uh, a blog on this. I'm actually just going to walk through this blog. Uh, there's a banner for the blog real quick. That that one is the blog that we're going to run through right now. And by the way, the video, this video running live is embedded at the top of the blog. So if you do pull it up, mute uh, mute us or something so that you don't get two audio streams at the same time. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to run through uh, first, what is the platform team experience like? There's a console experience and there's a CLI experience. So in the blog, I wanted to kind of differentiate between the two sets of teams by differentiating with CLI and console. So the platform teams side of things we're going to do using the CLI. And then the service teams side of things we're going to do using the console. Um, so as Rafa mentioned, this is a preview service. So there's some initial setup that you have to do. Let me pull the blog actually onto the screen. And Brent, so, while you do that, it, just quick question to you. If, if I was, uh, if I'm a developer and I don't want to go to a console, I can absolutely do this from the com command line myself as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. This is, you know, as with anything, there's an API, as with, you know, the services that AWS offers, there's an API, there's a CLI experience, and then there's also the console experience. Um, I, as I was thinking about it, I was thinking, you know, the service team may not want to actually get super hands-on with the AWS CLI. They may not be AWS experts. They're experts in writing their code and understanding what their code does. So they don't have to be AWS experts and that's how Proton can really help out. So they might choose to use the console. Whereas the AWS experts that are building all the infrastructure are probably going to end up using uh, the CLI or APIs or something else to build this. So let me run through some initial setup just so you're and I've done these things already, but just, I just want to point them out and explain them. Uh, this is a preview. So there's a custom API endpoint, and therefore there's a model that you have to add to your AWS CLI. So AWS configure add model is the command that'll do that for you. You can download the model. This, this basically shows us how to download the model. Then we add it to the CLI and then we delete the model. So, um, you'll have to do that if you want to experiment with Proton while it's in preview. The next thing we're, we do is we create an S3 bucket, and this is just for, for uploading the artifacts to. Proton is going to read artifacts out of this S3 bucket and process them and then make those available uh, for either plat uh, offering up infrastructure or offering up services. And we'll, we'll look at that in a bit more uh, detail in a second. Okay. So that's the initial setup. Uh, the next thing I wanna show you is just how do we get started? So we're going to first, uh, there's a templates, a uh, set of templates samples uh, repository uh, on GitHub. There's the URL for you. Uh, under, under the AWS samples organization, AWS Proton sample templates. So I've actually cloned that locally. You can see it uh, here, AWS Proton sample templates. And we're gonna be, I just wanted to bring up a load balanced Fargate service. So I've CD'd into uh, the load balanced Fargate service. Now, the next bit of setup, Proton is going to be building infrastructure on my behalf. And for that reason, we need to grant it access, IAM access to do that. So we're creating a role called the Proton Service role in this example, and then we're attaching an IAM policy uh, that is administrator access. Now, if you wanted to, you could scope this down and, and even potentially create a custom policy that only allows creation of the resources that you want. But for, for me, especially on a platform team, I probably have 
administrator permission and I want Proton to be able to uh, build infrastructure for me uh, as an administrator. So once I've done that, I attach, uh, I update uh, the Proton role to be able to use that policy and now I'm ready to go. So we've talked about Proton, we've talked about templates. Uh, there are basically two types of templates. There is an environment template and a service template. And uh, Rafa or Patrick, uh, do either one of you want to describe, you know, what's the difference in an environment and a service? Uh, so the environment will be where, where you want your, your service to be deployed to, right? So you can think of it as your, your EC2 instance or, or even just an S3 bucket, right? You could deploy a, a uh, you know, HTML or a CSS or a JavaScript file, right, to an S3 bucket. Uh, so the environment is where you're going to deploy your service, your services, uh, you know, whatever your, your product or, or tool is. Yeah, exactly. So uh, environments contain services. And then another thing to point out, I think, is that uh, environments have, you know, a set of shared resources and a set of shared policies that end up applying to all the services within. So if you need to apply something, you know, to every service, then you can do it at the environment level. And then if you need to apply, you know, permission or something like that to just a single service, then obviously you can do that at a service level. So I've, I, this is where I left off and I haven't done any of this uh, in my account yet. So I'm going to go ahead and. And Brent, can you just zoom in a little yeah, bit? Sorry point. to interrupt. A little zoom, zoom yeah. action. Yeah, Thank I did you. That, I did that for the terminal, but I forgot to do it for the web page. <laughs> All right. So I'm just going to first create uh, an environment template entry. Uh, I'm calling it Proton Example Dev Environment. Um, and then I'm going to create a major version for that, major version number one. And that's another thing that's probably worth pointing out is with CloudFormation, just straight CloudFormation, you don't really get versions or anything like that. You don't get the this notion of this is a big change or a little change, you know, major version, minor version, any of that kind of stuff. So we're bringing that to the table also. We can, we can make incremental small improvements with minor versions. And then if there's a big sweeping change, then we can go ahead and increment the major version and, and roll uh, teams over to that when they're ready. Yeah. Okay. While, while you do that, uh, versions are one of the key components of how do we how do we make Proton into a tool that allows you to keep your infrastructure updated? Because it's simple, if everything is properly tagged with a version, to say, well, my latest template is 1.6. Seven, but I have 20 services running on this, of which 10 are still in 1.6. And I can make choices. And Proton will help you update. And if the upgrade is simple enough, you can do it directly from Proton without even bothering your developers. But at a minimum, it gives you certainty as a, as a platform team that you know exactly what's not in the latest version. And because you own these versions, you can almost also tell not just who is in the latest version and who isn't, but what are they missing? If 1.6 yep. to 1.7 introduced a particular important critical security change that we need to apply, you now know exactly who do I have to change, so at least they move up to that one. Yep, totally. So we could, you know, after creating these version entries, we could sit here and work on our cloud formation and improve it, make sure that it's exactly the way we want, iterate. Um, let's, you know, since we're using a template that's provided in the samples repo, we're not going to do that. We're just going to go ahead and upload the template. And all the, all that we're doing here is we're tarring up, uh, you know, a set of cloud formation and then a manifest and a schema. Um, do, do, do you guys want to describe what is the, the relationship between the cloud formation manifest and schema? Yeah, so the, the schema is uh, how the administrator uh, is able to, to provide inputs to the developer. Uh, so if the, the administrator wants to allow a developer to select you know, how much memory or what, what port uh, he wants the service to run on, right? So the schema is really where you'll define the, the developer inputs, uh, and then everything else is your, your, you know, your templates and how your, your environment is going to be created and or how your service is going to be built. Uh, and so really where the power of Proton is really in that schema file 
because this is how you're saying, all right, I've abstracted all the complexity away from you. Here's the five inputs I want you to worry about and then go ahead and create your environment or your service. Great, awesome explanation. So the next couple commands that I ran uh, were pretty simple. Basically, I uploaded the, the template to S3. Then I, t in this command, create environment template minor version. I'm basically telling Proton, hey, go look at that S3 bucket. Here is the uh, S3 bucket uh, entry and then the, the key in the bucket to look for. So I'm just saying, go look at this file for minor version number one, major version number one. And it's going to create a minor version out of this template. And then the next command is just a wait, waiting for Proton to have processed that template and make it available. So I say make it available, it's available for us to then publish. So once we are 100% uh, happy with it and we're ready to offer this up to our customers, then we can publish this. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna publish major version one, minor version zero. And when you do this, by the way, just confirm in the blog, the expectation is that you uploaded minor version zero, but you can see that in the output here. So just confirm that. And then uh, when you're publishing, just make sure your minor version matches that. So I'm gonna publish major version one, minor zero. So this is 1.0 of my template. Yeah. Can I also add that that's probably the, the step that you're most likely to forget. Uh, so uh, in the console, we try to give you a banner. Hey, you, you know, you've, pub you've, you've deployed this template minor version, but you need to make sure you publish it. So yeah, just to call out, if, if you're playing with Proton, make sure you publish your templates. Good yeah. call, yeah. The idea here is that as an infrastructure team, as a platform team, even after you've uploaded a template to Proton and you feel good about it, it's probably a good idea to deploy it yourself a couple of times before you put it in front of your developers. Yeah. Because Patrick said before, right, that the schema is what abstracts all of those details away from developers. You want to have a, a high level of certainty that when they start to deploy it, it's going to go smoothly. And so we give you a chance to actually run a deployment yourself using Proton as if you were a developer, one or many, before you say, okay, publish, now it's ready to go. But yeah, the, the, I, I totally agree also with the call out. We injected a pretty clear call out on the console for, for that. So what we just published was our infrastructure template, right? It's the, it's the environment. So in our particular example, it's gonna be an ECS cluster uh, that is expected to be able to host a load balanced Fargate service. So the, the next template that we would update would be a service template. And this, this parameterizes uh, how a service should run inside my environment. And it's the same set of steps, so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna walk through them one by one. But instead of creating uh, the environment template, we're gonna create a service template, and everything else is basically uh, follows the same pattern. We're gonna create the service template, major version. We're gonna tar up the service example, upload that to S3. Then we're going to create a minor version entry. We're going to point Proton at it and then we're going to publish it. So th there's just been a, a, a lot of talk around major minor version, and I do have a question there, and Rafa, maybe um, you can answer this one. So do I have a way with Proton to just always deploy latest minor version, but not deploy latest major version? Is there any distinction from me as the developer using the tool? Do I get power of choice there? So the short answer is no, that preview no. As a developer, uh, there is this notion of the recommended version, which is defined today as the latest published version. And that's the one you're always going to be deploying as a developer. That's the one you're going to be asked to move to if you are not in it. Uh, I don't want to I don't want to say that this will change or say that it won't change. I think we need to look for feedback on that and see how customers intend to use it. Uh, we definitely have tools to add descriptions to versions so you can provide version guidance. And I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that in the future we will want to explore giving start certain controls to developers. Um, however, this, for now, is, is tackling this problem from the perspective of simplicity and streamlining. And so as a dev, you don't really get to decide 
or need to decide on versions, you're just going to be use, using the latest one. Makes nice. sense. All right. So what we've done so far is essentially uh, we've played the part of the platform team. And we've built a platform that we can offer up to our service teams. So what would that look like? What, from the service team perspective, uh, what what does this look like? What what can they do? So here we are now at the Proton console. And by the way, I went to console.aws.amazon.com slash Proton, um, this link. So super easy to get to, just slash Proton like anything else. Uh, it's, in, again, there's a preview banner at the top, just to remind you, this is in public preview. Um, so you can begin to use it, uh, but it's not, ready for GA yet. We want this to be, we want to be gathering feedback and, and that sort of thing. So definitely give it a try, test it out, see what you like about it, see what you don't, and provide feedback for it. Um, so let's open up the little side panel here. Remember, I, pr I built, as the platform team, I built uh, a service template and an environment template, right? So if I go look under templates, I now see my uh, environment template, and then I see my load balanced Fargate service template. So these are available for me as the developer or as the service team to use to build my environment and deploy my service without having to either A, know much at all, if anything, about AWS, or B, have all the permissions necessary to go out and provision all this infrastructure because Proton's going to do it on my behalf. So let's actually do that. So if I go to environment, the first thing we would need, of course, is to build an environment. So I can just create an environment and then it comes up with a list of all the available uh, environment templates. And you can see this is my version 1.0. Uh, last updated today, it has a, a name and a description. Um, it's the only one in my example, so obviously it's the one I'm going to pick. But you know, this is prepared for there to be a lot of different choices. There's even a search uh, search box, so you can imagine there's a lot of uh, potential possibilities. And remember this this notion of just fill in the the bits that we can't predict for you. So the environment is already defined by a cloud formation, and there's just a few things that we have to fill in that uh, the platform team doesn't know up front, like what do you want to call your environment? So let's call this, um, uh, let's see, Proton Demo Front End. And uh, let's demo the Proton Front End. Uh, the proton and and Brent, just to, while you're doing this, just uh, so and again, environments these are deployed by or created by the platform team, right? This is a something the platform team would do. Correct. Yeah. And remember, I created an IAM role uh, back in the in the early stages. I actually have to go back to the blog and look to see what I named it because the choices are uh, pretty numerous. Let me go back real quick. While while you do that. Uh, one thing that I, I, I really appreciate about the idea of having the role here is that as an infrastructure team, and, and, and Brett, you said it before, right? You you probably have administrator privileges or a very wide range of options that you can use, uh, but you want to be more contained in what you can give your developers. In an extreme world, and I'm not saying I endorse or recommend this approach, every customer will be different, but you could give developers purely just access to Proton to see and deploy templates. And that's all they need. Yep. Even no matter what the underlying resources are in those templates, we are not taking the permission on the role from the developer calling Proton at the time. We're taking it from the role just you, you just provided to Proton. Yep. So you create that separation of, of, of ownership that allows you to try tightly constrain what people can do while still enabling them to deploy all of those components that you need. So the next screen is custom settings. And this is part of the template. If there was, you know, different uh, sets of customizations that, as the platform team, you needed to ask, then you can add that to the template, add that to the uh, to the manifest, and get prompted for it. Here in the example, it was just uh, the CIDR range, and that's a pretty pretty handy 
thing to customize because for my application, I actually wanted it to be customized to a different uh, set of addresses. So I've customized the IP addresses here and I'm gonna hit create and that's all there is to it. This is gonna go out and provision all of this infrastructure for me as a developer, I can basically be done and know that my infrastructure is going to get provisioned. Now, as, as me, of course, I want to explore just a little bit more and see what is this doing. So I'm gonna go open up CloudFormation just to see, and look, there is Proton Demo front end uh, getting created right now. And if we look at resources, then you can see it's bringing up an ECS cluster, it's bringing up uh, an internet gateway, it provisioned a VPC, public subnets are getting created. So this is doing everything that I need it to do uh, without me having, with, as, a, as a service team, without me having to even know about it. Um, so we, let's go on while this is running in the background and let's actually uh, now go to provision our service. So in theory, I've just brought up my infrastructure, my environment. And so the next thing I need to do is, is, okay, well now let's deploy my service. So I create a service and again, I see my picker for uh, choosing the right template and I have load balanced Fargate service available. So now I can give my service again, fill in the blanks, give my service a name, uh, front end demo, I'm going to give it a description. And it's just, it's uh, looking at this, it's just, it brings up memories of, of me in my past building something like this on my really? own and the struggles of having to manage this on my own. And, you know, with the team, my team, you know, all of us working on this, building this. So it's so nice to see this in a <laughs> way where it's, I don't have to manage this anymore. You know, like it's really cool. Yeah, and I remember someone earlier uh, asked in chat about, you know, does how is this related to code pipeline? And this particular example template is actually going to build us a code pipeline and it's going to connect our repository uh, for future deployments. So it's asking me for the service name and settings, but then it's asking me for my repository information and the repository connection. And this is something that if you haven't done, you can go ahead and pop out right here and you can go and build a code suite, uh, code star uh, repository connection. So I did that earlier. I set it up for GitHub as a provider, but uh, your choice of providers are GitHub, GitHub Enterprise and Bitbucket. This isn't part, this isn't directly part of Proton. So if you want to see more providers, definitely reach out to this team. Uh, this is a different team that manages this and we're just using it, right? So we're integrating uh, the code suite uh, connections. So I've built, uh, I've uh, configured my service. So the next thing I'm gonna do is add an instance so that it comes up and runs a copy of my service. Um, and I'm gonna give my instance a name. Uh, I'm going to call it ECS demo front end because that's what my container name is. Uh, but again, you can call yours whatever you like. I'm going to deploy it to the uh, the Proton demo front end environment. I know that my container listens on port 3000, so I'm glad that that was being asked here. And I'm going to say that I want two copies because I want it to be a little bit. Uh, I don't want one copy. I want some fault tolerance. Uh, I'm being prompted to, well, how big is your container? What size do you need? And I know that it's not extra small because it's Ruby. So I'm gonna go with small. Uh, and then what is the image that uh, that is your container? And I'm gonna do, well, I'm gonna do my image. And we'll give it a unique name. And then there are some pipeline inputs for when we build the pipeline, how do we build the container ourselves? Like, is it a custom, is it the, is the Docker file named Docker file or is there a custom name? And are there any unit tests that we should run? And once you deploy it, there's a few questions queued up. I want to, I want to bring in. So you tell me when you're ready. I'm ready. 
Okay. So there were some good questions and, uh, you know, we have um, answers coming in the chat, but one was about cross account. Can these templates be shared? But it was answered not yet, but that is in the plan. Um, so that's really good to know. And that's definitely a use case that makes a lot of sense in the enterprise. Um, so there is a question, where is it? Here it is. So someone asked, uh, Garrett Johnson asked, can you deploy the environment separately? So let's say I want to build an environment on my own, not using Proton, but then have some, you know, teams deploy services to what I've built. So um, do you want to give some feedback on that? I'd leave that to Rafa or Patrick. I think it's a great idea. Uh, it's not possible right now, but definitely something we could try to think about in the future for sure. Yeah. So, so we, we didn't see it because it's a bit of behind the scenes, but uh, when you deploy an environment through Proton, there are certain outputs from that environment that we're going to be able to store and use it when creating the service, like your VPC ID, for instance. Um, so if you create an environment out of out of Proton, uh, we might have struggled getting those re getting those, that information. I agree; it's it's a good point. It's it's a point about what is the world where, as an enterprise, you can't really say all of my deployment is going to be this streamlined process of environment and service in Proton, right? Um, well, you have people going to CloudFormation directly because they are doing something experimental or different or trying something new. Um, there is lots to explore there, and again. With this service, the risk is always that you build so much to the get, from the get-go that it becomes untenable. Uh, so we're taking an approach to simplicity and then adding layers on top of it as we need. Uh, but that's what just is one of it. I would even say that whatever mechanism you have that built the environment that you'd like to sort of draw into Proton, uh, just use that. You know, especially if it's cloud formation. Just take that cloud formation and parameterize the few parts that you might need uh, to be able to vary from one platform, to, from one environment to the next, and then just ingest that directly into Proton and build a new environment. Um, yeah. If it's difficult for you to switch environments from A to B to C, then it's something that you should practice doing because it's a really good, uh, healthy thing for you to do from time to time. So, um, you know, that could be one motivation for uh, for you doing that is, hey, I want to get this into Proton. So I'm going to take my cloud formation that's been around for a while and I'm going to parameterize it and bring it into Proton. And then I'm going to start shifting all my traffic over to that new platform where my new services are running. And and by the way, there's there's a question around where where does CDK come in, come into the picture? You know, and, and I, I do think. There's a lot of choice here, and it's the, the idea is you're going to choose the right tool that's going to make the most sense for you. And if you know CDK and and building all your templates that way makes sense, then that's a good approach. But also CDK renders CloudFormation, so you could render CloudFormation from CDK and work it to to fit into Proton. So I mean, there, there's definitely choice. So yeah, it's based on your use case. Yeah, and then. So it looks like I have a load balancer up. I don't think the services are up and healthy yet, but we're going to go ahead and grab this DNS name and we're going to go to the endpoint. Oh, look, it is running. So yay, I, as a service team, was able to deploy my service and make it run in a fault tolerant way on Fargate. And you know the service team, me, did not have to build any infrastructure uh, or anything you know, necessary uh, to have a healthy service in AWS. Yet, I get logging. I get log aggregation through CloudWatch logs. I get monitoring. I get alerting. I get uh, fault tolerance. I get my VPC built in a healthy way. I get security groups that are that are plumbed the right way and and uh, allow just the traffic that needs to be allowed. I have IAM roles provisioned with just uh, what you know, the permissions that they need and so on and so forth. So I get all the advantages of having a super intelligent AWS knowledgeable platform team that built something for me, but I was able to do this on demand and I can go back and do it over and over and over again as needed. I could build this up and then tear it right back down. So uh, this is really cool. 
And yeah. you, 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 by the way, you forgot to mention, did, or maybe you did, CICD was also in there. And yeah. so theoretically, Brent, you could right now, I'm not saying do it, but you could push a change to your repo and then it would automatically deploy. Yeah. I yeah. Was, so the, I was, the, go ahead. Go ahead, Rafa. <laughs> I was going to make that comment that uh, that's, that's part of the beauty as well. It's running and now you can make changes to it. On the other side as well, if you are now put back your hat on of the infrastructure, the platform team, um, you know that Brent has just deployed this and is using version 1.0 and it's healthy. And if tomorrow you update the template in any way and you give us version 1.1, you can immediately show up and be like, oh, look, Brent's service is no longer in the latest version. Let's do an update. Let's talk. Let's do whatever we need to do. So. I think one of the things that we want to make sure we do a good job of is supporting you throughout the lifetime of that service. That six months from now, or maybe at the end of this demo, uh, you say, we don't need this anymore. Let's just delete. Then you delete it from Proton, and it's gone. And we will take care of decommissioning everything and the, the provision in the, the, the architecture for you. So it's truly supporting you throughout the lifetime of that service. That's awesome. This is such a nice way to interface with CloudFormation. As a service team, I basically don't. CloudFormation is abstracted away from me. And instead, the experts at CloudFormation in my company can build things the way that they need to be built and can just uh, you know, give those to me. So uh, Adam, you mentioned Cloud uh, uh, code pipeline, that's being that's still being provisioned right now. So it deployed my service and did the initial deployment and then it's building the code pipeline, which does take a bit, but you can see here that it's that it's bringing up all the appropriate, uh, you know, bits and pieces of code build. It, it built an ECR repo uh, pipeline role and, and so on and so forth. And let's check now to see. If we have a, there it is. There's my pipeline uh, coming up, and it just started the initial build. So this is going to potentially, uh, assuming it goes all the way through, it's going to redeploy my application out to my uh, Fargate cluster using code that was built internally rather than my image that I started off with. And by the way, if you're a developer that just deployed your service, the platform team, and, and let's say you don't want to see the pipeline. You, you have no AWS console access. Well, with CloudFormation, you build your chat bot that sends this into Slack or whatever your chat service is. And now everything you do is, uh, you don't even have to go to the console um, if you just want CLI. So just other ways that to be creative, you know, you can build on this. You can, you can see the status of the pipeline in Proton as well. So you can at least go there and check. Is it running? Is it done? That's awesome. Yeah, that's so cool. Uh, let's go back to let's go back to uh, Proton. And you know, so there, there still were a couple questions uh, around comparing and contrasting Proton with Service Catalog. So I just wonder if maybe you know, before we finish, we just do another elevator pitch of Service Catalog, Proton. You know, maybe some of the differences. Yeah. I didn't actually, I would say service catalog is a tool to govern and vend your CloudFormation templates in a secure and managed way. You're going to write a bunch of CloudFormation templates. You're going to put them there. And you're not going to be confident that anybody can go there, get them, and deploy them as intended. We take that similar experience, not really much that we what, what we need to complain about how that works, and add a bunch of pieces on top of that. So. When you're gonna when you're deploying a cloud formation stack in a world of microservices, you're never you're probably never gonna deploy one. You're gonna deploy at least two, one per instance of your pipe of your of your pipeline. And then you're gonna need a pipeline. And then you're gonna need to connect CloudWatch. We do all of those things in one single, in one single shot. So you could have somebody go to service catalog and do a deployment for staging, a deployment for production, then they deploy a pipeline on, on service catalog, and they have to like carry the information from one to the other to make everything go streamlined. We just do all of that at once. So when you compare cloud service catalog with Proton, the key thing is that they speak to the developer at a different level. One is more abstracted, more high level, 
the other is more of a, a primitive that you can use to create that perfectly defined process of sharing cloud formation templates and then build on top of it. We have talked to actually a handful of customers that have done exactly that. They have built a, a shared services platform not different to what Proton can do based on service catalog. This is just ours. Nice. All right, so uh, let's just summarize. As a, as a platform team, I built the uh, templates for my environment, for my service. Then I could deploy an environment as a platform team, or a developer potentially could deploy as a, uh, the environment as a platform team. But either way, the developer can deploy and manage their service, get a pipeline, get everything that they need going, and have have all of this be available to them just by filling in, you know, a few uh, input boxes, or you know, on the command line. Uh, answering a few questions, filling in a few variables. So uh, this is this is awesome. Uh, a platform for building platforms. It's great. Uh, who should? How should people uh, leave feedback? So there is a there is a feedback link in the in the console as it it's a, um, a, a sorry a preview service. And I think I just saw flash for a second there, the GitHub roadmap. We, in the containers PM team, we have a public uh, GitHub roadmap. And it's been a phenomenal tool to interact with the community. We want to do the same thing here. I, I will go straight ahead and say, it's a new roadmap. We just created it. So we will adjust not just what's in the roadmap, but the roadmap itself and how it's managed in the coming weeks or months. But it's an excellent way to get information, to have me and other members of the team see it and engage in some interaction. Awesome. And by the way, one thing we didn't talk about. So I, I'm Rafa, I'm going to let you to answer this one. How much does it cost? It's free. Uh, very similar. Very, think about Proton, speaking about comparisons with other services, think about Proton in a very similar way as you think about CloudFormation. What we do is free. The underlying resources that you're going to provide are not free. Those are standard AWS resources that you pay the standard rates. But creating templates, registering templates, deploying services, checking out on those services on, on Proton, all free. Awesome. Fantastic. All right, Rafa, Patrick, I want to thank you for joining us. And definitely, if you want to see more about Proton, check out uh, Rafa's reInvent talk, uh, EMB008. Uh, it's a new launch talk, AWS Proton, Automating Infrastructure and Provisioning Code Deployments. So check that out. And otherwise, uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Happy deploying. Thank you, Thank you for having us. You bet. See ya.